So let's continue with the second day of uh, the summer school on, meta, uh, on nanophotonics and metamaterial uh, here from St. Petersburg. So we are welcoming again the chair of the school and also uh, a very well-known um, scholar in the field of optics and nanophotonics, Professor Andrei Bagdanov. Please continue with the, uh, the second part of uh, me theory. Please go ahead. So uh, again, on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the first day, we have <coughs> took lecture on the, uh, on the basics of scattering theory, starting from an introduction and an overview to the green tensor. Uh, and also we followed by uh, uh, and, uh, the, first, the first part of lecture on me, on me theory. It is a very uh, important theory. It is a reference to all scattering theories and here on the second day, we will continue on the second part of me theory with uh, with Professor Andrei Bagdanov. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just uh, th thank you very much for the introduction. So, dear colleagues, let me continue. So, first of all, I think I need to share my screen. So, I have a, a couple of slides from the previous lecture, which I would like to to finish. So. Uh, let's just uh, maybe a brief reminder what, what they're going to do. The, uh, the, our main target is uh, to solve the scattering problem for spherical particle. And in order to solve the problem for spherical particle, we need to introduce a basis for vector functions. Yeah? We need to solve uh, such kind of equations inside the sphere. Inside the sphere, we have some permittivity and, and uh, propagation constants is proportional to the refractive index. Yeah. And outside of the sphere, uh, we assume that we have, we have air. So K is a just K node. Yeah. So, and uh, in order to construct the basic functions, the vector basic functions, uh, we first we need to solve the scalar, scalar, scalar equation. Yeah. And then if you know the solution for scalar equation, then we can construct the, the three independent vector functions, which will arrange a basis for a vector field, yeah? And we did it, so I skipped these details. These functions are called L, longitudinal, so it's potential. Uh, and in, in, in this function, we will not take, the, we will not take, take into account these functions uh, because uh, this, function, uh, this function is described potential field. We will work only with function M and N. So uh, then we analyzed the uh, solution of scalar equations, and this is the main result. So we have a uh, Helmholtz equation in spherical coordinates, and, and the general solution consists of two functions. This function psi with indices E, L, M, and uh, psi with indexes O, L, M. Uh, first index E or O means even or odd. This is mean, uh, even or odd. Uh, so uh, for, e uh, for even function, I assume the dependence through the cosine for the odd function, dependence is proportional to sine, yeah? So what is Z with in this L? Z is a spherical Bessel function. So when we have uh, several types of spherical Bessel functions, so it's, it could be just a simple Bessel function with, with no singularity in the origin, it could be uh, Bessel function of second order, and this function has a singularity in the origin, and it could be a uh, Hanke function. Hanke function uh, is just outgoing or incoming wave, but we will take, of course, ongoing wave because we, we are talking about scattering, yeah? So, and uh, then in order to, to calculate the uh, vector functions, we need to substitute uh, this uh, Psi function, yeah, to here, yeah. And then we will get the uh, magnetic harmonic, yes, like M, magnetic. N is electric harmonic, yeah, okay. Uh, this, this is a table of scalar functions. So if I will neglect the dependence on, on R, yeah, on, on radial coordinate, and I will keep only dependence on angles like angle theta, polar angle, and angle phi, azimuthal angle, I can plot the absolute value of these functions, this one and this one. So let's have a look 
uh, how they look like. Yeah. So first, uh, the this row corresponds to the uh, M index index. M is a azimuthal index. Yes. And the left part of this figure correspond to the odd function, and right part correspond to the even function. Yeah. Okay. And I will uh, count the angle phi. from x axis. So this angle phi from x to y in x y plane, yeah? From x to y. So if m equal to zero and l, and l equal to zero, uh, I have uh, no, no dependence. So this function is equal to zero, yeah? Old function, so cosine equal to one and associated Legendre polynomial also equal to one. It means that uh, absolute value, yeah? I mean, it's like, a, I assume that this is a just a, bro, like abs absolute, I'm sorry, like absolute value of this expression, yeah, absolute value. This is R, yeah, this is R. So, uh, R equal to one is a sphere, yeah. Then uh, if I will take my uh, angular momenta equal to one, I have uh, two options. My function could be odd or even, and index, index M could be zero or one. So in this case, I will have this beautiful, uh, this beautiful function. The uh, blue region, yeah, blue region correspond to the uh, to the case when uh, the expression under the under the absolute uh, under the module yeah is positive, so when uh, angle phi is from zero to half of pi cosine is positive yeah, then uh, along y-axis in angle phi equal to zero and then when angle phi more than half of pi yeah exp uh, cosine is less than zero. So, but I have absolute value here, so it's, it's still positive. But in order to, uh, to mention that uh, under, the abs under the model, I have a negative function, uh, we will plot it like, like in, in green color, yeah? So, and this is a, just absolute value of these an angular dependencies, yeah? They're a very, very beautiful table, but this is a scalar functions, yeah? Scalar. But we interesting in, uh, in vector functions, yeah. Okay. And, and then after the substitution, we can calculate these uh, four independent vector functions, okay? I will skip it. This is a just asymptotics uh, of these functions uh, at uh, uh, very far from the origin. So one, one can see that uh, this uh, radial, the, uh, radial part decays faster than other terms. Uh, this, this term, this term is proportional to one over rho square, one over rho square. It's not so easy to plot, okay? So, and this, this term is proportional to one over R, one over R. It is why I can simplify these functions very far from the origin. And I, uh, in for convenience, I, I'll, I'll introduce two new functions like tau and pi, okay? Okay, and uh, this, uh, how they look like. So let's maybe to analyze it a little bit more, more detail. Uh, what did I plot here? The orange color corresponds to the absolute value, absolute value of my vector spherical harmonic in the far field, far field region when rho coordinate is uh, uh, quite big, so far from the origin. Okay, and then on the surface, yeah, on, on the obtained surface, I will plot uh, the 
vector field. Yeah. So, for example, this is a, a magnetic harmonic. This is even. Yeah. The angular momentum equal to one, and azimuthal number equal to zero. This is a, and and you can see that the electric field lines uh, are concentric circles here. Yeah. So it's like a parallels of my torus. It, it's not a, a torus. Yeah. It's uh, almost donut, almost with vanishing hole, yeah? Donut is with vanishing hole, okay. This is, uh, for electric harmonic, with the same indis, uh, indices, the, uh, this surface, surface are completely the same. The surface is completely the same as for, for magnetic one, but polarization is different, yeah? So here we can see some uh, radial lines, yeah? This is parallels, this is, and these lines, he, lines for electric field here perpendicular to the lines here. If I will take uh, the angular momentum number two, I will have a different radiation pattern, yeah? But similar polarization for magnetic harmo mag harmonic, so it's like, it looks like a concentric circles. But actually I have the, uh, just the mathematical code. Let me show it, yeah? It's, it's quite short. I will share this code with you, yeah? And using this code, it's possible to plot harmonics. For example, you can see this is the harmonics. And you could have, uh, just analyze the polarization of these harmonics in details. So, what, for example, what could you identify this harmonic, for example? What is it? Is it magnetic or electric one? So here I can see that uh, the vector field lines like almost also concentric circles. It means that this, this harmonic is magnetic one. So I, uh, also I see four lobes, yeah? Uh, it means that this is, uh, angular momentum here is, is two, yeah? So it means that this harmonic, for example, magnetic magnetic so uh odd or even it depends uh on the orientation so uh, it's difficult to understand without coordinate axis uh, because the uh odd and even uh the, the only difference between them is uh, just a rotation by half, half of pi angle along the vertical axis yeah so it's odd or even i don't know so but uh the uh let's say, let it be odd, yeah? Then uh, angular momentum is two, yeah? And here, this is, uh, function lies in, in a plane, yeah? I can say that magnetic number is also two. This is the same harmonic, but uh, electric one. Electric harmonic, let, let's say, O, two, two, yeah? So on. So you could play a little bit with this code in Wolfram, and uh, just to, to distinguish between different harmonics. And the final test will contain uh, some questions about these harmonics, okay? Mm -hmm. Let me have a look in, in the chat. Maybe I, uh, I have some questions. Just a moment. We still don't have questions. I don't, uh, we don't have, okay, yes. okay. But probably uh, I will. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I press escape. Let me go back. Okay, let's go further. So, and this is a, a just a. Uh, it was the last slide of, of the of the uh, yesterday lecture. This is a, uh, some literature which I uh, recommended about about these uh, vector spherical harmonics. Okay. Uh, let me start the, the next lecture, the second part. Lecture number four. Okay. And in this lecture, uh, the uh, our target is to, to solve uh, the, the problem, the scattering problem for, for a sphere. 
So uh, this is the outline. So uh, first, I'll introduce just general scheme uh, how to solve knee problem. Then we will discuss about uh, plane wave ex expansion in terms of uh, spherical waves. So the question is, is it possible to represent plane wave in terms of uh, spherical waves? Yes, the answer is yes, it's possible. And we will expand the plane wave in terms of spherical waves. And then we will obtain the mi coefficients and we, we analyze this mi coefficient. And I will finish the lecture with a quasi-static limit and with uh, uh, answering uh, the paradox which I uh, announced in the, in yesterday yeah, about the uh, non-zero imaginary part of the polarizability for small particles. Yeah. Okay. So the I mean, problem formulation, yes. Okay, what is, this is a general scheme. What should we do in order to solve a uh, me problem? Yes. First, uh, we need to expand all the field outside my particle in terms of vector spherical harmonics. But the total field outside my particle consists of the scattered field. Yeah, this uh, outgoing wave. Yeah. And it consists of a uh, plane wave. Yeah. Okay. And I need to expand the total field inside, uh, the total field outside the sphere in terms of vector spherical harmonics. So incident and scattered. Yeah. And then I need to expand the field inside my particle also in terms of vector spherical harmonics. And then I will apply, so in the, uh, in the expansion of the scattered field, I will have some unknown coefficients. Yeah, the, the incident, incident field is known, scattered field is unknown, and uh, I will have some set of coefficients, uh, of expansion coefficients, they are unknown, and also I don't know the field inside my, my sphere, but I, I will have some expansion and uh, the expansion coefficients are also unknown. So I, I will have four unknown coefficients, yeah? Or like four series, yeah? For, for each angular momentum, I mean, yeah? And in order to find these four coefficients, I need four boundary conditions. And these two vector equations for tangential components of electric and magnetic field uh, are equivalent to four scalar equations. And uh, solving these four scalar equations, uh, I will find the all unknown coefficients. This is the main strategy, yeah? Okay, let's, uh, I think I, I will try to skip uh, maybe uh, some cumbersome calcul uh, calculations and some uh, uh, maybe non-trivial uh, techniques here. And I will address you uh, to this book, Boren and Huffman, Absorption and Scattering of Light by Small, by, by small Particles. In this book, you can find all these derivations uh, uh, in details, yeah? So uh, all, all the integrals are calculated and so on and so forth. But here, it's a just, a, a just a sketch, yes? What, what should we do? This is a uh, incident field and my field uh, is linearly polarized and, it's, uh, and my field is polarized along x axis. Let me have a look. Yeah, x axis. So it means that my, this is my incident field. Yeah. In general case, it has two, uh, two components, x and y. But in my case, uh, incident field uh, is polarized along x axis. Okay. Yes, this is a. Uh, uh, unit vector. I can expand this this unit Cartesian vector in terms of uh, basic ve vectors in spherical coordinates. And then, uh, in order to provide this expansion, I need to project, yeah, to project uh, all spherical harmonics to these vectors. It's quite easy to do. What? And then, uh, after changing this. Sorry. Sorry, can I interrupt you here? We have two questions. The first one asking about uh, the L um, vectors, spherical harmonic vectors. So we are now using just M and N. Where yes. Did, well, so we abandoned L, we don't need it, Y. And we yeah. have also another question. Uh, uh, different photon beam modes can be represented by uh, orthogonal spherical harmonics. That's also a question. Yes. Okay, so please. Okay. And, and, and the question about why we, uh, uh, do not use the harmonic L. Uh, 
let me answer this question. So, you know that uh, first I will consider the field inside, inside the sphere. Inside the sphere, I can write that divergence of the displacement vector equal to zero because there are no charges. Yeah, it means that, but inside, inside this, this sphere, I have a homogeneous medium. It means that I could take epsilon and put it out of the, uh, this operator. It means that inside the sphere, let me, in, in, inside the sphere, divergence of the electric field equal to zero, yeah? And I know according to the properties of uh, vector spherical harmonics, divergence of M equal to zero, divergence of N equal to zero, but divergence L not equal to zero. So it means that uh, because of, uh, of, uh, of these properties, uh, of this property, yeah, uh, that uh, divergence of electric field inside this field should be equal to zero. I do not need this uh, harmonics L, their potential. The, the, these harmonics you need if you will have some charges which induce some potential field. My field is completely solenoidal. Yeah. The same story outside, uh, outside the sphere, outside the sphere, the, the uh, divergency of electric field also equal to zero. So I don't need to use the harmonic L in, in, inside. Okay, is it clear? Hope, hopefully, yes. Okay, okay, and this is the answer. This is the expansion of the incident field, incident field in, uh, in terms of vector spherical harmonics. What is the most important point? Guys, please pay your attention to the last index one one because here guys you see that uh, here in the incident field i have dependence on phi like a cosine phi where here m equal to one and the same story here you see here cosine m m phi but m equal to one for the incident field for linearly polarized plane wave. And here the same story. No sine two phi, sine three phi, sine four phi. It means I have only one uh, azimuthal number, m equal to one. It means that here, this series over two indices, yeah? We don't need to, uh, to calculate, to, to take a sum over two indices here. We need just, uh, I change the summation order, yeah? And uh, internal summation will be over L from M to, to infinity. But here, M, only one possible value of, of M is one. It means that this summation should be, uh, oh guys, here, I'm sorry, this is not L. It should be L here, also not M. It should be L. From L equal to one to infinity, from L equal to one to infinity. No double summation, only one sum, because M again equal to one. This is a property of plane wave, okay? Let me go further. It's, this is a very important point. So this is an expansion of the internal field, uh, in incident field, and all coefficients unknown. This is a, I will define this coefficient like a EL, where EL def is defined here, okay? So, uh, and this is an expansion of the field uh, inside the sphere, yeah? Uh, maybe one, one more important point, guys, I'm sorry. So here, what is interesting, uh, this, this uh, additional index, yeah? 
here, one. One and one. Index one me means that this is a uh, Bessel function of first kind. I'm sorry. Of first kind. Bessel function of first kind, yeah. It means uh, just a simple Bessel function. So, uh, in the expansion of the incident field, we have only the Bessel function of the first kind, okay? And uh, what about the field inside the sphere? In, in, uh, inside the sphere, yeah, inside the sphere, the also I need to take uh, only the Bessel functions because uh, Bessel functions of second kind and, and Hankel functions, they have a singularity in the origin. Okay, so it, it means that I need to take the just the Bessel function of, of, of the first kind. Okay, and this is an unknown coefficient, CL and DL, these are unknown coefficients, yeah? For electric and magnetic fields, they, they are the same, like D here, D here, C here, and see here, yeah? And for the scattered field, yeah, for the scattered field, electric magnetic one, I need to take the Bessel function of third kind, uh, means that Hankel functions, yeah? Because, because scattered field is outgoing wave, and in order to describe outgoing wave, I need to take the Hankel function, yeah? And then next step, I need to apply this, boundary conditions, these boundary conditions, in order to find these unknown coefficients, A, B, C, and D. And these coefficients, uh, it's, it's a set of coefficients because my coefficients uh, are functions of L, yeah? Okay, and the next slide, uh, I will show you just, just answer. When you apply these boundary conditions, you will get the following result. This is a ma uh, one of the main result of me theory. I mean, uh, one of the main formulas, yeah? Because uh, these coefficients are completely defined uh, the field inside the sphere and the field outside the sphere. So these coefficients like C, C and D are responsible for the field inside the sphere and these coefficients also called scattering coefficients are responsible for the field uh, outside the sphere yeah what is interesting these coefficients are functions of frequency omega indeed here i introduce uh, just parameter x so called size parameter yeah and this size parameter is equal to just a uh, omega over c multiplied by a where a is the radius of my sphere yeah, A is a radius. So this is called uh, dimensionless frequency or just size parameter. Okay, and now guys, uh, let's analyze these coefficients and let's try to introduce uh, sc uh, scattering cross section in terms of this coefficient. So uh, I think the most interesting part is the, it, it's uh, coefficients A, uh, a and B, yeah? And coefficients A, uh, it's uh, coefficients before the uh, mag uh, electric harmonics and B, coefficients before magnetic harmonics, yeah, for electric field. Okay. We have, we have two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, yes, yes. So, so someone is one, uh, uh, Guido Gozan is wondering if the summation is still wrong. The indices of the summation on the previous slide, if they're still wrong. And another question. Uh, can you? Uh, yes, please. Here I need to take the sum over L. I think the, the, before this one, probably. When, when you when you just took uh, yes when you just took uh, m equal one, so I think yeah this one here. This is wrong. 
it is a question it is a question for you <laughs> guys guys it's uh, okay actually this this is true i will try to explain you uh uh i have two minutes so let's assume that we have two axes like uh, let's say this will be uh in this m and this will be in this l yeah uh first and uh, in this m should start from zero and uh, finished uh, at l yeah when this is line will correspond to the case when index m equal to l so it means that i need to take a sum along these lines yeah like summation yeah but now i would like to change the summation order let me change the the color let's say maybe green one so it, the, then in order to uh, to take a sum over the same the same values first i need to take a sum over l l starting from here is l equal to m and then to infinity so you see this term from l equal to m to infinity and then i need to take a sum over all possible m's from here 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 and here the same it's just a simple trick uh, like from uh, mathematical analysis or linear algebra uh, i need just to change the summation order uh, i hope okay. i i answer your question Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is, can you explain more about the physical meaning of the boundary conditions you used? Yes, yes, of course, guys. This is uh, quite simple. Uh, let me... Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for, 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 the, for, for this question. Uh, here. This is just a continuity of tangential components of electric and magnetic field. I have a dielectric. Uh, it's my sphere and tangential components to the surface of my sphere should be continuous. I have two tangential components. These are uh, theta, compo uh, theta component of electric field and phi component of electric field. Yeah, and they should be continuous at my interface. And the same story for the magnetic field. All tangential components of the magnetic field should be continuous at the surface of my sphere this that, that, that's all okay then uh, a question we missed about uh, can we represent photon beams with orthogonal spherical harmonics yes any so guys uh, spherical harmonics are a complete set uh, a complete set means that this is a basis it's not uh, even uh, only complete it's all in, it's even orthogonal so it means that any field, any beam, uh, Gaussian beam, Gaussian uh, Laguerre beam, Bessel beam, any field could be expanded in terms of vector spherical harmonics. The simplest case, of course, is their uh, plane wave, but any field. Okay, do we have time for one more question? Yes, please. Okay, so here is asking about periodic uh, structures. So uh, scattering cross-section is defined for a single particle. For periodic structure, uh, there is no scattering cross-section. Yes. Uh, for, for periodic structures, uh, we need to introduce the transmittance and reflectance. And can be also expanded with the spherical multiples. So in, in this case, if you have a periodic structure like a metasurface, it's much more convenient to work uh, with a plane wave expansion because uh, if your structure is periodic, you have a dif uh, dif diffraction channels. Uh, usually you have a finite number of open diffraction channels. And, uh, uh, and it is convenient to describe the energy uh, carrying by uh, in, uh, going through these diffraction channels by plane waves. So if you deal with a uh, metasurfaces or gratings or photonic crystals, uh, it's convenient to work in, in the basis of plane waves. But sometimes there are some exceptions, but if you will analyze the 
near field of, of unit cell, it's possible to, to, to describe the uh, using the vector spherical harmonics mod. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me go further. So this, uh, these are coefficients, yeah, they are coefficients. And uh, in this L, uh, is it could be equal to one, two, three, any any integer, any integer, yeah. Okay, and then we know that uh, this expression for the extinction cross section, yes, and we derived this expre expression at the previous lecture, yeah. And then uh, and now I know the uh, ex uh, I know the series. For incident field, I know the old coefficient for scattered field, and, and I can substitute uh, this series for the incident field and for scattered field into, into this integral. And then uh, uh, I will take this integration yeah, over, my, over, over the whole sphere, and, and cross terms uh, are orthogonal to each other, and then after this integration, I will get this very beautiful and short result for extinction cross section. Here you can see that extinction cross section is given by by, uh, by a sum. Yeah, here. This is a sum. It's 2L two two L plus 1 and real part of uh, AL and BL. Yeah. Uh, me coefficients, yeah. This is for uh, extinction cross sections, yeah. And uh, in order to calculate scattering cross section, you need to to substitute uh, a series uh, instead this electric field and uh, a series uh, of vector spherical harmonics with the non coefficients instead the magnetic field. And in this case, uh, after integration, you will have this expression for uh, scattering cross-section. This these are very beautiful results. They are uh, very, uh, looks very short, yeah? Of course, the, the coefficients uh, looks, looks uh, quite cumbersome, but anyway, this expression is very beautiful. Uh, what is important, guys, here? You see that uh, the uh, extinction cross-section and scattering cross-section uh, is given by a sum. It means that extinction cross section is proportional to the extinction energy. And we can see that extinction in extinct energy is given by a sum. What does it mean? It means that uh, all the vector spherical harmonics scattered field independently. Yes, and, and total scattered energy yes, is given by uh, square of these coefficients. So, and I can associate this uh, uh, different, scattered uh, different vector harmonics with different scattering channels. It means that the uh, scattered energy scattered energy goes to different different harm, uh, different harmonics like l equal to 1 l equal to 2 l equal to 3 l equal to 4 and and so on and so forth yeah and the same story you see that uh, electric harmonics and magnetic harmonics uh, carry the energy independently, yeah? It's also impossible to introduce uh, more uh, errors corresponding to the uh, other scattering channels, yeah? Okay, so this is the important fact that energy scatters through independent channels corresponding to the uh, electric and magnetic spherical harmonics with different uh, angular momentum. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is a very strong result. Uh, uh, we have a question about this, if you don't. Yes, please. 
So on what on which basis we choose the L values? Again, please. On which basis we choose the values of the L uh, angular momentum number? On How which? we choose the L values? That's the question. Okay. Ah, uh, this is uh, okay. I think Ilya Raskazov uh, today uh, will tell you about some uh, uh, some numerical aspects about uh, elf, uh, what uh, how many different angular momenta we need to take to get the correct result. Okay, uh, the their uh, short answer is the bigger the particle, the more different angular momenta you need to take. Yeah, but uh, for analytic in analytical results you need to take a summation over all channels all channels but in practice if the particle is small uh just l equal to one is enough okay uh, another question can we use theory to understand uh, oplate spheroid particles like an approximation for a disk particle okay uh, could i uh, i would like to uh, okay. open the, uh, open the chat and uh, read the question by okay. myself uh, chat uh, should I go to the chat? Yes, it is Mean Theory Part 2, today's lecture. Okay, uh, uh, who is the author of the question? So, so Maxim, Maxim is asking um, about uh, the steroids. Uh, Maxim, so is it possible to use Mean Theory for ablate spheroid in order to understand what happens uh, with, with the disk. Maxim, uh, this is an interesting story. Uh, the scattered field could be expanded in terms of vector spherical harmonics. This is true. But what is important? Because of the, um, the, uh, the short answer is, is it, it's possible. It's possible uh, to use uh, similar technique uh, to get the results even for non-spherical particles. But uh, there are a lot of difficulties there, yeah? And uh, the, uh, if you would like to use uh, some uh, not a sphere, you need to use the method so-called extended boundary conditions, yeah? In order to analyze the scattering from uh, non-spherical objects like a like disk or, or cylinder or something like this, yeah? It's, uh, it's, it's possible, you need to calculate just some surface integrals and uh, the problem in, in the boundary conditions because for, for, the, for, for the sphere, it's quite easy uh, to apply the boundary conditions because it's, it's a sphere, yeah? And for the, like a cylinder, it's much more difficult, but it's, uh, it's possible using the, some Green's theorem and, ex and extended boundary condition method. In principle, it's possible. Okay, and the uh, next question from Ramil. Uh, why it's called plane wave expansion? If been, okay, so it's an expansion of plane wave in terms of uh, vector spherical harmonics. Okay. Okay, another question about absorption. Yes. So uh, here, here it is. Uh, are we I considering see. absorption? Are uh, here we discuss absorption, less case, where the interaction absorption. Okay, so it's quite easy. So uh, in order to uh, understand, uh, uh, to calculate absorption, you need to take uh, the difference between extinction. You need to subtract the scattering from extinction. And, ab and absorption cross-section absorption cross will be equal to, to this difference. Okay. If a particle spherical is embedded in an isotropic medium, how use vector spherical harmonics to get the scattering and extinction cross section? Well, this is a uh, go, uh, good question. Actually, I, I have never worked with a, an isotropic environment. And uh, uh, this is a good question, but I, uh, I think I, I know some, uh, some literature. I don't remember what uh, do they consider an isotropic environment or anisotropic particles. I definitely know some literature about anisotropic particles, but about anisotropic environment. So I think maybe Yaras Kazov uh, knows about it uh, much better. So uh, let's uh, keep this question for, uh, for him. Or maybe I will answer after the lecture. I, I will have a look. 
But uh, the problem is asymptotics, strictly speaking, the uh, uh, vector spherical harmonics will be not orthogonal uh, in for an isotropic environment. So we'll have some problem. How do, uh, how do the scattering cross section change when you're going to the classical to quantum? So uh, in quantum, so uh, this, uh, I not completely understand what do you mean? So uh, uh, what, what do you imply and under the word quantum? Small particle or, or quantum uh, theory? I mean the scattering, prob uh, scattering of some quantum particles. So on question, what the particle align in care the particle along in the care type medium, yes, in the some anisotropic. So this, this is a, go, a good question. In if we have some anisotropic environment, we need to introduce, I think, different bases because in this case, uh, we have a mixing of uh, different spherical harmonics at, at infinite uh, point. So uh, I think it's uh, no, uh, not, not so trivial, not so trivial. We need to introduce, I think, in another basis or maybe to, to work with uh, this basis somehow. Mm -hmm. Quantizing the field. So uh, if you will quantize, you can quantize the field. It's not a problem. And the result will be the same. The same. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is just a, a number of kind of number of photons. Yeah, this coefficient is proportional to the number of uh, scattered photons yeah, of different polarizations. Okay, guys, let me go, go further. So what is interesting? Please have a look that uh, we know this is a, a Bessel function, a spherical Bessel function of the first kind. And I will use the following trick. The Bessel function Spherical Bessel function could be represented as a sum of two uh, Hankel functions, like a Bessel function equal to the uh, outgoing wave plus incoming wave. If you uh, take a sum, uh, you uh, just according to the definition of Hankel functions, you will get just a Bessel function. What is also interesting that uh, Hankel functions of the first and second kind, so incoming and ongoing wave, they are just uh, uh, complex conjugated. Yeah, this is a uh, complex conjugation, this line. So, and then I can uh, substitute this Bessel function to here and to here in the two, two places. And please have a look, you, you see the, the denominator. Yes, denominator. In the, in the denominator, I have a very similar story. The denominator is very similar to the de denominator, but uh, in the denominator, I have the Be Bessel function instead of Huntley function of the first kind. But after this substitution, I can uh, uh, just take out of the fraction this factor, one over two, and I will have uh, just a Bessel function of the uh, first uh, Huntley function here, and uh, the denominator will be equal to denominator. And it is why I can write one here, yeah? But uh, also I will have the second uh, Huntley function of, of this of the second kind, yeah, second order. So, <clears throat> but uh, what can I say about this fraction? Uh, let's say that refractive index is real, n is real, Bessel function is real. Uh, is this, uh, this function also real? Only I have the one complex function. This is a Hankel function of second kind. But actually I can uh, replace this Hankel function from the first kind 
and then take a conjugation. It means that nominator is just a conjugated denominator. So it's, it means that this fraction is just like a z over, or maybe let's say, I'm sorry, z conjugated over z unconjugated, yes? Of course, absolute value, absolute value is equal to one. Yeah, absolute value. But it means that the, uh, this fraction could be represented as a, like a minus two i delta with some constant, like a uh, complex exponential function, yeah? because the absolute value is, is equal to, to one, okay? Okay, guys, please have a look again. So uh, my, my coefficients A and B uh, could be represented in, uh, in this form, yeah? So like uh, one over two, one minus, and this is, uh, this is my fraction, yeah? I just uh, introduced new notation, yeah? That uh, this minus e to two i delta l is equal to, to this fraction, yeah? And, and for b, I, uh, I can do the same, yeah? And then uh, let me uh, just substitute, so what, what is the uh, uh, square, sorry, what is the square of AL in this case? One can see that uh, square of AL in this case is just a sine square delta L, yeah? So, and the same story for, for B constant, yeah? This is a, this one. And just simple calculation, you need just to take the absolute value from this expression, yeah? Okay. Uh, what the very beautiful fact we will get from this analysis? Uh, we can answer the following question. What is the maximal possible value of A and B? <clears throat> Let's assume that <clears throat> A can be like a 1 million or 1 billion. It means that you can have huge amount of scattered energy, yeah? It means that if you have small particle, but if this coefficient is huge, maybe it's, it's infinite, I don't know, uh, in this case, we will have a huge number of scattered energy. Is it possible or not? Unfortunately, not. For the sphere, we will have such kind of restriction that maximal possible value of uh, square of this coefficient, because this coefficient is just a delta, da? delta, yes, it's delta, uh, sine delta. And, and maximal possible value of sine delta uh, is one. And from other hand, uh, I, I know that each coefficient correspond, corresponds to the some scattering channels. It means that we have a, a limitation on maximal possible scattered energy into the each scattering channel corresponding to the angular momentum uh, uh, some certain angular momentum and uh, uh, polarization, like electrical magnetic. And it is possible to introduce so-called single channel limit, single channel limit. So I, uh, I just uh, expanded 
the k naught square because k naught is 2 pi over lambda. I have 2 pi in, in denominator, 2 pi square in denominator, and lambda square in denominator, yeah? So, and then this is a, just uh, one term for, for certain polarization. So, uh, it's interesting that maximal possible uh, scattering cross section for each channel doesn't depend on the radius of, of a sphere. You see, the, uh, the maximal possible scattering cross section is proportional to lambda square and proportional to angular momenta L. Dependence of radius of sphere, no dependence on the material. So it could be like from one dielectric or another dielectric. So you need to care about only uh, wavelength and, and uh, angular momentum L. Uh, let me have a look. Do we have some question or not? Not, okay. We are drawing. Let me go further. So, uh, interesting fact, guys. Uh, we have some de denominators, yes, like, like here. Let me consider uh, just the scattering coefficients here. Yeah? So uh, I told you that uh, the maximum possible value of the scattering coefficients is one. But uh, how it's possible to achieve this value? And uh, in order to answer this, uh, this question, let me have a look at my denominators. Yeah, like here and here. So uh, let's imagine that uh, we have zero, zero denominator. If the denominator equal to zero, it means that we have a resonance, yeah? But unfortunately, in, in the denominator, we have a, some equation in complex uh, numbers in complex functions, because Hankel function is a complex function. It has real and imaginary part. So, and uh, unfortunately, uh, this equation doesn't have real roots. So it's, uh, this denominator cannot be equal to zero for, uh, for, uh, for real frequencies. It could be, zero only for some uh, complex frequency. So uh, it means that we have, we, we, we can find some roots, some zeros for this equation, uh, but only for complex frequencies. This is just a, a denominator, yeah? Uh, this condition, when the denominator equal to, to zero. The denominator equal to zero at some complex frequencies. So in this complex frequencies, have some real part, it's like a position of my resonance, and imaginary part. It's like a kind of decay rate, yeah? And for coefficient, uh, it is important that, uh, uh, for, for example, a coefficient A and coefficient D, coefficient A is the coefficient for scattered field for electric harmonics, and D is the coefficient also for electric harmonics, but for internal field. And these two coefficients uh, have the same denominator. It's quite natural, of course, if you have, uh, because uh, if this uh, you have a resonance, you have uh, the resonance at, at the same time for internal and for external field. If you have a resonance for external field, you have increasing of uh, value of your, of your external field, it results in, in, in increasing of scattering, yeah? So it is why the uh, uh, magnetic and electric harmonics inside and outside the sphere, they have uh, the same condition for, for resonance, yeah? And actually, uh, it means that if you have a sphere, you could consider this sphere as a resonator. This resonator uh, has some eigenfunctions, also called resonance states, yeah? And these resonance states could be characterized by angular momentum and polarization L for, for, for a sphere. 
actually the uh, this fe uh, this sphere uh, has much more actually much more eigen fu uh, functions eigenvalues that we can excite by a plane waves yeah plane wave uh, excite only the uh, only harmonics with uh, m equal to one in principle we could rotate the coordinate system and we could excite uh, 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 other harmonics, but they are degenerated. Okay. Uh, so, uh, if, if we have some resonance, we could introduce quality factor. Yeah. And quality factor, uh, I can introduce in the following form. It's like a ratio of a real frequency to, to decay rates to gamma. So this is a, uh, just a typ typical definition for, for quality factor. Okay. So, and we have different resonances of, uh, for different angular momenta. And, and it's possible to associate different angular momenta uh, to different so-called multiples. So the uh, multiples uh, for L equal to one are called like a, uh, dipole resonances, yeah? If L equal to two, th these are quadrupole resonances. L equal to three, octopole. And if L equal to four, this holds a hexadecapoles, but it's not a uh, very often a word yet. You usually, uh, we can restrict ourselves only by uh, octopoles. Dipole, quadruple, octopole, yeah? And uh, both of the sets uh, of resonances could be electric or magnetic. So we could say about uh, electric dipole resonance or magnetic dipole resonance and or electric quadruple and so on and so forth, yeah? So, okay, uh, let me uh, consider uh, our website. In our website, we have like a me calculator. So, uh, just a moment. Uh, fees, me. Okay, guys. So, this is the address of our me calculator at, uh, at, at the website of our department. This me calculator uh, was created by my colleague Konstantin Lodutenko. So here we can uh, change the host medium, uh, wavelength. Yeah. So uh, we could use not only uh, different units, like uh, we could work in a f uh, frequency domain or in a wavelength domain. Uh, a, a lot of we, we can consider like a bulk sphere homogeneous or core shell or multi-layer sphere. Uh, if you uh, you could change the refractive index, it's real part, imaginary part of the refractive index. But actually, here even we have uh, some additional materials. Yeah, you could use argentum, al aluminum, uh, gold, copper, silicon. So. Uh, and actually, you could take, see these uh, different materials. Uh, you can take these materials from a refractive index database and calculate uh, scattering for sphere made of different materials. Yeah. So let me uh, take some material, maybe with refractive index 3.5. I will neg neglect losses just for simplicity. The radius. Uh, of my sphere will be 100 nanometers, so diameter 200 nanometers. So, and uh, range, it's from three to 1,000. And here you can see, guys, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, scattering cross-section dependence. So this is scattering cross-section. Normalized cross-section. This normalized means that uh, the scattering cross-section is normalized by geometrical cross-section. But geometrical cross-section, it's just, uh, uh, pi multiplied by r square, where r is the radius of my particle. Yeah. So and we and we clear see some resonances. Yeah. This is a, a normalized cross section as a function of wavelength. And maybe let me continue up to two microns. You see, uh, here we have a region. It's a region of where, where wavelength is quite long. When the wavelength is much bigger than the diameter of my particle, yeah? And here we see that there are no resonances, no resonances. 
I have only uh, decay of scattering cross section. And actually, guys, this is relay limit. Do you remember that we have shown that scattering cross section decays? Scattering cross section for small particles decays like one over lambda to four. This is exactly this dependence. One over lambda to four. And this is a called rel relay regime. Yeah, let me go to my presentation. Go back to my presentation. I will show you. This is the same story. So uh, this red region where no resonances, this is called relay regime of scattering. Yeah. In principle, it is uh, possible to have here to some resonances for plasmonic particles, even if this uh, uh, wavelength much bigger, much bigger than size of the particle, you could take just a particle with a diameter uh, 10 nanometers or 20 nanometers, and you can have uh, for such particles uh, uh, plasmonic resonance in the visible range, yeah, in this region where in the relay regime, but it is electrostatic resonance, plasmonic resonance, yeah. Uh, okay, let me go back to our website. So it's like one micron. So uh, the most interesting, of course, case is when we have some resonances, yeah? And here, it's a total scattering cross-section, but it's possible to plot uh, the dependence. Uh, it's possible to uh, analyze the contribution of each spherical harmonic to this total uh, scattering cross section. And here, for example, if you're interesting uh, to the dipole mode, electric dipole mode, yes, you can see, or maybe let's say first magnetic dipole mode. You see, we have, this is a contribution of the magnetic dipole mode to the total scattering cross section. So what does it mag uh, ma magnetic? Uh, it means that here, I take the coefficient b, b, and dipole means that l equal to one. So actually, uh, this plot, the green one, is just a dependence on b one square on on the wavelength. Yeah. Then let me take into account. Uh, let me have uh, have a look at the contribution of uh, electric dipole. Yeah. And this peak could be associated, I'm sorry, this peak could be associated with a magnetic dipole resonance of my particle. Yeah, it's magnetic dipole resonance. Uh, and this peak could be associated with their uh, electric dipole resonance, yeah? Let me count, for, for example, magnetic quadrupole. You see? Next peak is a magnetic, I'm sorry. This peak is a, is a magnetic quadrupole. So, uh, but if you have a look uh, at the scattering cross section at small wavelength, when the wavelength is much smaller than the diameter of my particle, you will see many, many, many resonances. And the resonances uh, become more, more denser and denser and denser. It is uh, quite difficult to distinguish between them. Yeah, you'll see. So, and uh, thus we can distinguish between uh, three possible regimes. Yeah, regime of uh, big wavelength, 
when the size parameter is small. This is a Rayleigh regime or Rayleigh scattering. When the scattering cross section decays as one over lambda to four. Then we have some so-called intermediate regime when, when uh, we have some clear resonances, yeah? And we could distinguish between electric, magnetic, dipole resonances, quadrupole, and so on and so forth. And these are called me regime, yeah? And then when the wavelength much shorter than the diameter of your particle, we can talk about geometrical optics. This is a three possible uh, regimes of scattering. Let me have a look. Do we have some question in chat? Yes. yes, we have four of them. Yes, let me have a look. Okay, first, how do we explain acoustic vibrations of sphere? Okay, so uh, about the uh, ac vibrations of spheres, uh, about the uh, about the scattering on trembling or trembling particles, we will have the lecture on Friday uh, by Professor Alexander Padubny. Yeah, but uh, if you're talking about a self-action like a frequency shift, about lamp shift, I, I will talk about this lamp shift uh, at the next slide. Uh, the question from Ivan Toftul. He's here. HB coefficient has many resonances. When people say n pole resonances, do they mean the first? Yes, it's a good question. Let me have a look. Let me go back to our website. Uh, yes, I would like to mention this, this point. Uh, let me consider maybe uh, short of from. One thousand from two hundred nanometers, and I will show you. Uh, let me clear all drawings, and I will consider just for instance maybe. Uh, you see, this is our first resonance. The green line corresponds to the magne magnetic dipole resonance, but actually we have another magnetic dipole resonance. Let me show you. Uh, it's not so trivial. This is the first magnetic dipole resonance. And here we have another one magnetic resonance. And here we have another one. So indeed, each uh, mi coefficient has infinite number of poles. And all these poles corresponds to this, the same orbital momentum and the same polarization. So it means we have different eigenmodes, different eigenmodes, but all of these different eigenmodes behave in a similar way, in the inf uh, infinitely far from the, uh, my particle. It means that this is a common feature of any open systems. Yeah? When we have some interference yeah, of two uh, different modes, strictly speaking, uh, these modes are not orthogonal in terms of energy. This is a, a, a very interesting point because usually why we can distinguish, uh, why we can represent a flux of scattered field as a sum of different channels. Because the total field, the total electric field is a series over some harmonics. The total magnetic field is also the series over some harmonics. Then we will, when we'll calculate the pointing vector, we need to calculate the cross product, this sum by this sum. And I will have a lot of cross products. So it means that the, we have a lot of interference terms. But when you will take integration over some sphere, these cross terms disappear because they are orthogonal to each other. But uh, it means in this case, we can, we can uh, say that we have independent scattering channels. Yeah, but uh, for, two, for two modes of the same mi coefficient, we have the similar behavior. It means that these two modes 
two different resonances at two different frequencies can interfere in the far field. And in this case, if you try to expand the total energy, not in terms of vector spherical harmonics, but in terms of eigenmodes of your sphere, so usually in quantum mechanics, uh, when you use secondary quantization, we can say that the total energy is just sum of energy in each mode of the system. Here, because my system is open, it's not a true. Because different eigenmodes, different eigenmodes can interfere in the far field. And this is a very tricky story. So I can uh, share maybe some literature. So uh, it's, uh, uh, I will, can recommend you the, uh, my, uh, the papers by my colleague from Cardiff University, uh, from UK, uh, Igor Mulyarov. Uh, uh, he's doing some research about resonance state expansion. Resonance states are just eigenmodes of, of, of uh, open systems. So it's, it's very in interesting and very beautiful story. Okay. We have, we have a 12 minutes, so. Okay, I think I, I'm all, all mis, uh, okay, guys, uh, let's keep your question to the uh, end of my lecture, okay? So, uh, the most important thing that I would like to, uh, to share with you is this is about these three regimes that, that we have some resonances and uh, that, uh, please guys, use this me calculator, yeah? Okay, let's go further. So it's interesting that it's possible to superpose different scattering channels. So uh, let me, uh, I could construct like multi-layer sphere in order uh, two different mi coefficients will have the resonance at the same frequency. In this case, uh, I will have overlap of several resonances corresponding to the different angular momentum. And in this case, you could overcome the single channel limit, but uh, it still works, but you just uh, 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 achieve maximum scattering at the same frequency through the different channels. In this case, you will have this sharp resonance. This is a paper by Shan Hui Fan from Stanford University, uh, Stanford University in two, uh, by 2010, yeah. So, and here they uh, propose some design of multi-layer, it's not a sphere, it's a cylinder, but does matter. And, and for this cylinder, they uh, superpose like four channels, M equal to one, it's uh, M equal to two, three and four. Yeah, it's a cylinder, and this is azimuthal number for cylinder. And this effect is called super scattering. And now you can find a lot of, old, a lot of papers about super scattering for the, for different objects. Okay, and uh, the last part uh, of my lecture is the following. Uh, these coefficients a and b, uh, they they are de depend on the uh, they depends uh, on uh, they depend on the radius of, of my particle. Yeah, we have some dependence on the radius of the particle, and now I would like to take a limit when my radius of my particle will tend to zero. So the limit of small, of, of, uh, small sizes. And I will have a look what will happen. What will happen if I will tend the radius of my sphere to zero. So I will skip uh, some of this uh, theoretical derivation. So I need just to expand Nominator and denominator, I need to expand all these uh, functions. I need to take asymptotics at small values of arguments. Yeah? And if you, if you will do this, uh, you will see that uh, for very small radiuses or, for, or in vicinity of your particle, when, the, when you're very close to your, dialect, uh, to, to your dialectic particle, uh, your field could be represented as a gradient. So in the in, in vicinity of the particle, you have a potential field, yes? 
And I, I told about this, that the near field could be represented uh, as a gradient of some potential. So, and uh, if you analyze this, uh, this potential, we will see that this potential has the same form as the potential of a point dipole. It means that uh, the electric field in the vicinity of the, of the small particle behaves as a point dipole. And then, uh, and this uh, dipole is proportional to the external field. And we can obtain the, the following relation between polarizability of small particle, like alpha is, a, is the electric polarizability of small particle and mi coefficient. So this is a uh, general uh, relation between the mi coefficient and polarizability, yeah? So, and then I need to expand mi coefficient, yeah, in terms of for small arguments. And if you will do this, this is just expansion that I, uh, I used. You will get the following result. Please have a look, guys. This is a, maybe the central result of the quasi-static limit. It's important that this uh, mi coefficient, expansion of mi coefficient, has the following, uh, the following denominator, yeah, with uh, this term and this term, yeah. What do they mean? Let me maybe show at the next slide. Okay. So I have the following, uh, I know that, I know the relation between polarizability and mi coefficient. It's a fact number one. The fact number two, that I could expand the mi coefficient corresponding to the electric dipole in, in, into the following form, yeah? For small values of size parameters. So here, here, x is much less than one. And I can use this expansion, yeah? And then uh, by substituting the mi coefficient to here, I will have the expression for polarizability of small particle. And what is important, guys, do you remember this expression? This is an electrostatic polarizability of a sphere, clausius massotti formula, yes? And, and X, what is X? X is, uh, as I told you, is omega over C multiplied by A. This is X, my size parameter. But if you will tend frequency to zero, quasi-static limit, or you can take tend A to zero, small particle, you will see that these terms this one and this one disappear because X is very small, yeah? But anyway, approximately I will neglect this term in spite of the fact that it depends as, as X square because it's a correction to real part. Real part is quite huge, yeah? Uh, what, what I mean, uh, if, X, if X equal to zero, if X equal to zero, both of this term of these terms disappear, yeah? If X is very, very small, this term give me small correction to real part of polarizability. But when X equal to zero, uh, my alpha is real. So it means that this is a small correction to finite value. And I can neglect this small correction to the uh, finite value of polarizability. But this term is qualitatively different because this term is proportional to imaginary unit. So, and here we can see that for small particles, for small dielectric particles, we have uh, imaginary part. And, uh, and uh, if you compare nominator and denominator, uh, we will see that my denominator, I'm sorry, 
my denominator, uh, my correction is proportional to the static polarizability too. So, and uh, this is a small exercise. Do, uh, do you remember that uh, I told you that it's possible to find this correction if you compare the scattering and extinction cross-section in dipole approximation? Please check, guys. Please check that if you will take this polarizability, extinction cross-section, oh, I'm sorry, this is a misprint, yeah? Uh, it's not extinction, it's a scattered. That extinction cross-section will be equal to, scat to scattering cross-section in a dipole limit if you will take this complex par polarizability. And, and in this case, uh, there is no paradox. Even the electric particle has imaginary part of polarizability. Okay. Let me go further. And this is uh, why do we need to take into account this correction. Left figure shows the uh, extinction efficiency, ex extinction normalized to geometrical cross-section for a silver particle with a radius 10 nanometers. Yeah, uh, it's very small particle. And here you see I have this resonance for small particle. And this is not a mere resonance. This is a electrostatic resonance or plasmonic resonance. Uh, and uh, red curve is the exact me theory. And dash line, this is a quasi-static limit. And you see that for small particles, uh, you could use this uh, simple uh, alpha node polarizability without any corrections. Yeah, it, it works well. It's a simple quasi-static limit without any corrections. Yeah, but if you will take the silver particle with radius 30 nanometers, me theory, so it means it's the exact solution. This is a red curve. And quasi-static limit give you this dashed line. You will see we have a huge difference in efficiency and some frequency shift. So it means that uh, Strictly speaking, quasi-static limit is not applicable. But we have uh, two corrections, yeah? Again, we have uh, correction for real part of polarizability. And this correction results in appearance of frequency shift. And this shift could be associated with so-called like in quantum mechanics for atoms with a lamp shift because it's kind of interaction with vacuum. It's like a recoil because of the radiation. Yes, if, you, if your particle radiates, you have some recoil and this recoil results in, appear, in appearance of the frequency shift. And this additional correction because uh, of the uh, uh, so-called radiation correction. This is a frequency shift and in radiation correction. And if you will take into account this uh, frequency shift and radiation correction, uh, this uh, green line you see here, yeah? Situation becomes better. Not perfect, but, but much better. We will see that we have uh, the same position of the resonance, but a little bit different efficiency. But, uh, in principle, you don't need to use uh, ap approximation. If you like to, to correct, uh, to get the correct result, please take the polarizability uh, as just proportional to the mi coefficient. You have the uh, exact expansion for mi coefficient, you can substitute it and you will have the correct result. Not even for small particles, but even for particles of bigger size. Okay. So, we and are out of time now. Yes, so I, I, this is my last slide. This is just a summary. Thank you. This is a summary of my lecture. This is just main formulas. Let me summarize. So, it means that uh, the scattering and extinction cross, -section, ex -ex uh, cross sections uh, could be represented as a sum 
uh, of uh, mean coefficient. For scattering cross section, we need to take a square of mean coefficients, yeah, a, a square of absolute values. And this uh, uh, coefficients corresponds to the independent scattering channels. For extinction cross section, we need uh, to take the real part from these coefficients. And uh, these coefficients uh, have maximal possible value. It's equal to one. It means that we could set the, the some uh, single channel limit. So the some uh, finite uh, scattering cross section uh, for, uh, for a sphere. And, and this maximal scattering cross section doesn't depend on the radius, on the material. It depends on the, on the uh, wavelength and er, uh, angular momentum. And uh, polarizability is uh, re uh, connected, uh, electric polarizability is connected to, to, to the coefficient E1. Yeah, and if you will expand this coefficient E1 uh, for small values of arguments, so like, like in quasi-static limit, uh, you will see that your polarization will have imaginary part, which is responsible for extinction. So I think I finished with the introduction uh, to the, uh, the myth theory. And uh, uh, I think, oh, Christina Friziuk and Juan Fernando Scarbaton, uh, Sasha Padubny, uh, all of them will talk about uh, me theory and we will uh, have some small overlapping, but we, we will uh, make it intentionally uh, because uh, to maybe uh, to have uh, better results. Yeah. Okay. I'm finished, guys. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Thank you very much. I think uh, probably you can answer these questions on uh, later. In, in or chat? Now? Yes, later or now? Uh, I know. Okay, let me have a look at civil question. Nature of course, the static was a bit correspond to the resonance shift. Uh, Mikhail Petrov. Yes. Yeah, this is true. This is true, Mish. I, I, I told you about this resonance shift. Okay. Uh, so, a question by a friend. If you, uh, if you combine two different hemispheres of different materials, can you use still me theory? Yeah. Uh, who was the author of this question? Uh, Efrin Sierra. Okay. Can you make the sphere by joining two uh, hemispheres? No. Okay. In principle, uh, strictly speaking, me theory works only for spheres. Yeah. Uh, uh, if, you th if you will take two uh, hemispheres, uh, it will be difficult to set boundary conditions. It is possible to solve numerically or using the uh, some extended boundary conditions, but the results will be uh, not so elegant. What does the width of each peak mean? It's a, the width of the peak uh, correspond to, to the uh, quality factor. So if you will take a ratio of the wavelength, so lambda over de delta lambda, well, delta lambda is a width of your peak at the half of, of its height, yeah, uh, uh, you will obtain the uh, quality factor of the resonance. And you will see that high order multiples uh, have higher quality factor. The peaks become more narrow, 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 and narrow. In the limit, you could, you could even have whispering gallery modes because whispering gallery modes also uh, described by me theory. And these spring gallery modes can have huge quality factor, yeah? Like, okay, how can we suppress the quadrupole and has dipole scattering? So there, uh, yes, it's a called kind of uh, uh, scattering engineering. And you can do this using, for example, multi-layer sphere. And then coupling between the modes. Mm -hmm. Actually, there is a coupling between the modes uh, from the same mean coefficient. So because in, in this, uh, if you will consider, for example, coefficient A1, A2, or B1, B2, each of these coefficients has many poles. And uh, in each of this, of this, of this pole corresponds to, this, to some uh, eigenmod of, of the sphere. And the modes uh, contributing to the same mean coefficient can interact, can interfere in the far field. So they, they can uh, kind of like affect each other in, in, in the sense. So we, we will have a coupling 
between these modes through the far field. Okay. Yes, actually, I, I have an answer uh, to the question by uh, Pirgo about overlapping electric and magnetic resonances. This is the answer. Uh, if you have overlapping of um, electric and magnetic dipole resonances, in this case, you, you, you can completely suppress the backscattering. Yeah, and this effect is called Kerker effect. Uh, Christina Frizuk uh, will talk about Kerker effect a little bit. So. But you could find more information in this paper in Nature Communications by 2012. Misha Petrov, uh, I answered this question. So for periodic structures, we use plane of expansion, then uh, which practically relevant scenarios we actually use vector spherical harmonics. So, uh, for example, I, I have some papers uh, with Christina Frizuk when we use the vector spherical harmonics for periodic structures in order to, uh, to analyze multiple content of uh, eigenmods of, of uh, metasurfaces and uh, photonic crystal slabs. So it's possible uh, because uh, vector spherical harmonics uh, form a complete set of function. As I told you, any field, any field could be expanded in terms of vector spherical harmonics. Okay. Uh, so some words about anapole mods and zero. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, this is a... Uh, uh, topic of the lecture by uh, Ivan Fernandez Carbaton. We'll talk about Anna Paul and uh, uh, Andre Yevluchin will talk about Anna Paul. It definitely is it's, uh, quite natural to talk about Anna Paul here, uh, Anna, uh, but uh, I, we have not enough time. So, Anna Paul, just strictly speaking, uh, I told you that at, at, at the resonance we have a maximal scattering, my mean coefficient equal to one, but actually it is possible that, uh, but it's, it's impossible that the denominator uh, will be equal to zero, but it is possible that denominator will be equal to zero. And if the denominator uh, is equal to zero, you have no scattering in some, uh, into some channel. In this case, uh, you, you can say about a complete disappearance of scattering in some channel and uh, associate this effect with so-called anapole, uh, which could be, uh, which could, can have different interpretations. So we have many questions, uh, but yes, uh, the next the next lecture in two minutes, uh, yes, we really uh, apologize. Uh, we are short of time. Yes, guys, maybe let's uh, let's uh, uh, maybe ten, 10 minutes for break. Maybe let's start at uh, 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 eleven ten. Yeah. Yes, eleven ten. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Andrei Bagdanov. Okay. So we, are, we are waiting for the next lecture by Ilya Skazov. Yes. On, and it is a continuous on uh, a multi layer sphere on like particles in yes. short time. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.